Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to let you know about Chili. I'm a narrator over on Chili, you know, kind of like similar to what I do here, but Chili is an awesome app for horror fans featuring over a thousand horror stories, over a dozen narrators, and some of whom you might know of from YouTube, you know, like me, or my good friend Autumn Ivy, as well as full-length novels, exclusive series, and Chili Originals. You can select and change the ambient sound in the background of the stories whenever you want to without affecting the story that you're listening to. And we release hours of new stories every week. If you click the link in the description down below, hit download, start your free trial, then you can go see if you like it for yourself. Also, Chilling is constantly doing fantastic giveaways. So if you head over to thechillingapp.com and frequently check things out, you might be able to leave a review and sign up for an awesome giveaway. So once again, scroll on down, click the link in the description, Check out Chilling. Let me know if you love it. And now, on to tonight's story. Case File 02173 The following has been transcribed from audio journal entries found in the Ahab 2. A commercial fishing vessel, recorded by the ship's captain, Murray Reynolds. The Ahab 2 set sail for a fishing run on May 1st, 2017. The following records were made between May 2nd and June 13th. Inconsequential entries have been removed. The recordings are as follows. Entry 1. The recording device turns on to the sound of shuffling as it's being moved around. After a few seconds, the shuffling noise stops, and a voice can be heard. Is they on? Hello? Ah, I see the light. Because that means it's working. This is Captain Murray Reynolds of the Ahab 2. My first journal entry on what will be my final fishing run before I retire. Kids got me this to document what they're calling a historic trip. It's funny. I'm not sure I'd agree with them on that statement. I've been out on these seas for almost 50 years. Knowing this will be the last time fills me with, um, despair. All I've ever known in this life, you know, I don't, I don't think I've been very good at life on land. My late wife, Emily, had lost her battle with cancer just a few months ago. My son said he wanted me to move closer to him. He said it's to help with the grandkids, but I know he worries about me. Both my children know that I can't take care of myself, not on land anyway. Emily always took care of me, the kids, our home. Sure, I'd work around the house, but she was my rock, you know. I'm sure she sometimes feels like a living nanny. She never complained. I know that I married you and the sea, Emily would always tell me with her gentle voice. She was so understanding, and she was just a good woman. Maybe better than I deserved. I'd give anything to be with her right now. Miss her. Miss her so much. I always wanted to retire so I could spend more time with her, but I never had the heart to leave this behind. No. It's too late. Oh, and then. And my God, this has gotten sappy. Didn't mean <laughs> for that to happen. Old man tends to ramble on a little too much. I guess my age made me soft. We got a good crew of three men with me. And he's been with me a couple times before. Good kid. He's a hard worker. Michael, who stepped onto my boat for the first time just yesterday, comes very highly recommended. Think he'll work out. He seems to have a good head on his shoulders. He's strong as an ox. And of course, that salty bastard I call my friend Steve. <laughs> Let's count of the number of runs we've done together. He's not very far behind me in age, but he's still as quick as ever. I told him this would be my last run. Left another boat to be here, said he wouldn't miss this run for anything. He's a good man. And um, I'm proud to call him my friend. I'll keep this thing updated. I can. The weather's beautiful. We should have a fruitful couple of weeks. The weather's supposed to hold until the end of the month. It'll be long back then. So I better go see what the crew's up to. Make sure they're ready for our first spot. I'll check back in the morrow. Uh, how do I 
turn this thing. Uh, the recording ends. Entry 2. The recording device turns on. Is Murray Reynolds, captain of the Ahab 2. I guess I don't even say that every time, right? I'm used to hailing other ships, now recording my ramblings through for a uh, for journal. It's been a good couple of days, I'm in our few halls, would you know it. I was right to say it'd be a fruitful trip. Fish just spilling out of our nets, we pulled him in. Even Steve couldn't help but crack a smile. <laughs> our work's done for the day. The boys have a game of cards below, asked me to join, but I promised my kids I'd record every day, so that's what I intend to do. You know what's funny? I um, only ever felt at home on the water, but now, now that Emily's gone, I can't help but feel a little uneasy out here. Steve says it's because I always knew she'd be at home waiting for me. I'm going home to an empty house. See, Emily was kind of like my lighthouse. I'd been through my fair share of rough seas, hard times, but knowing I'd see her beautiful face again it made it so easy. I miss her. Steve calls me lucky to have ever had someone like her in the first place. It's only natural my heart is aching the way it is. It shows how strong my love is, specifically my love for her pain I feel for missing her always on the outskirts of my mind. When I'm throwing a net out or setting out of the crew playing cards, the hole I feel in my heart, it's always there. <sighs> Sorry to whoever's listening to this. I just realized you probably don't want to hear a sad old captain talk about how much he misses his dead wife. Just something that's on my mind. I want to get it out. I promise every entry won't be like this. Is Captain Reynolds signing off. The recording ends. Entry 3. The recording device turns on. The wind is faintly heard in the background. Is Captain Murray Reynolds of the... Well, you know who I am now. At least I hope. Did a bit of a rough day today with the sea. Nothing we couldn't handle. It caught me by surprise. There wasn't any nasty weather in the forecast for at least another few weeks. Skies suddenly turned gray, the wind picked up, the sea got choppy. Luckily, I got an experienced crew, so they were ready for anything. Still, as I look up into those now ominous looking clouds, I can't shake the strange feeling. Steve and I, you both feel a change in the air, a different taste in our tongues. It's hard to explain, but. When you've been at this as long as we have, it's almost like a sixth sense. You know, you know when something terrible is about to happen. I radioed in just to be safe, but I have faith we'll be fine even if we get caught in a storm. I've seen this ship through more than a few storms in my day. The old girl may not be much to look at. She'll hold up against anything Mother Nature can throw at her. A voice is heard in the background calling for Murray. All right, I'll cut this one short. Try and come in tomorrow, but if we do run into a storm, it may be tricky. It's Captain Reynolds signing off. The recording ends. Entry 4. The recording device turns on. Strong winds and heavy rain can be heard hitting the window. There's Captain Reynolds of the Ahab, too. I'm sure you can hear my crew and I have entered a nasty little storm. Yesterday, I, when I checked in, the clouds looked a little... Ominous. The storm is unlike anything I've ever seen. The wind and the rain have been relentless, hitting our skin like thousands of tiny knives. Haven't made much progress. Felt like it's best to stay put and wait for the storm out. At least wait it out as long as we can. The clouds are so dark. It's as, as if someone threw a black blanket over the entire ship. Without our lights, we can barely see. Don't understand how this harsh storm wasn't in the forecast, but these things happen. Tried to radio the Coast Guard for some information, but couldn't get a clear signal. I guess I'm not surprised by that, considering all this rain. Mother Nature's anything but cooperative. We'll be alright. A storm with this intensity can't last more than a day or two. A loud crash of thunder is heard in the background. At least I don't think it will. 
There's a story my first captain used to tell me about a, a great storm that carried evil within it. The ship would be stranded in a storm, the crew would be pulled into the unfathomable deep. Their afterlife on Fiddler's Green ripped away from them. They were forced to live out their eternity trapped in the dark waters by a horrific creature that would give no quarter. I always, I always liked that one. Even if it did give me the willies when I was a young lad. Looking out over the sea as it's being pummeled by this storm, I, I can't help but think of that story. You know, it sounds like nautical nonsense, as Emily would put it. There's always a lesson in old tales like that. The lesson I took from that story was to never underestimate a storm. There's enough danger within one without some horrible monster. No matter how long the storm lasts, the crew and I, we have enough food to last us weeks. It wouldn't allow us to be anchored that long, but... We'll see how things look tomorrow morning, if we have to. We'll head back to shore. I'm not going to risk the lives of my crew for one final paycheck. I'm off to join the crew below deck, maybe try some of that chili that Andy made. I haven't had a decent chili since Emily passed. This is Captain Reynolds signing off. The recording ends. Entry 5. The recording device turns on. Strong wind and heavy rain hitting window can be heard in the background, much louder than before, along with occasional thunder strikes that appear relatively close. This is Captain Murray Reynolds of the Ahab 2. We're stranded at sea. Last night something happened I, I can't explain. About half past midnight something hit us on the port side. It was loud, like, like a cannon. We woke all four of us from our slumbers. We, we heard the noise again as we dressed, this time at the ship's stern. I ran out without any rain gear to see what happened. I, I, I can't explain it. it. Looked like an ungodly hand grabbed onto the stern of the ship. I, I swear I could make out wrinkled fingers, black nails, a, a skin that was, that, that was pale as death. I rubbed my eyes to adjust to the low light, thinking that I was just seeing things, but I, I know what I saw was real. I watched in horror as the hand slowly pulled down on our ship, as if it was trying to pull us into the water. And for just a second, the stern of the boat was about to enter the water. I, I began to slide towards the stern of the ship, and whatever in God's name was pulling us into the water, I, I screamed for my crew to step back. I'm not sure they could have heard me. I grabbed onto the closest line that I could find to stop myself from sliding. I looped on and, and in the water, in the water, I, I, I saw it. The evil the storm brought with it was something from an old tale I now believe no living man has ever seen, or if they have, they never lived to tell about it. I saw the outline of what looked to be even more large hands in the water. It was a face, it was so clear for, for just a second. I felt its eyes on me, its godless and sharp red eyes, and then I, I heard a loud snap as the ship was released. I fell over, I watched the hand slowly move out of sight, and against my better judgment I quickly ran over to the ship's stern. But. It was gone. My crew ran out to check on me. See what had happened. None of them saw what I... What I saw. And they're saying I must have been half asleep. Even Steve laughed about it. Reading too many old tales, my friend, he said. As he patted me on the back. I, it wasn't until this morning that we realized what had happened. This... Thing pulled our propeller clean off along with most of the engine. We have no no means to repair what's missing. There's still no signal from the radio. I pleaded with the crew to believe me about what I saw. Even a few hours later, they still think I'm crazy. But I saw the hand, the face, it could have been the evil from the tale my old captain used to tell. The, the unfathomable deep. No, I... I need to get rest. The stress of the storm must be getting to me. And we'll wait this storm out and radio for assistance. It'll be alright. I just... 
I need to get a hold of myself. This is Captain Murray Reynolds signing off. The recording ends. Entry 6. The recording device turns on. Strong wind and sleet can be heard hitting a window in the background. Several thunder strikes can also be heard. Several deep breaths and sighs are recorded before any speaking begins. <sighs> this is... Uh, this is Captain Murray Reynolds of the Ahab 2. During my years on the sea, I've experienced fear on many different levels. However, the level of terror I'm feeling is unlike anything I've ever felt before. I, I have a hard time finding any words to even make an entry, but I think now, more than ever, I must keep these journals just, just in case we... Can't even think of that. We'll be all right. I gave the crew my word that I'd keep them safe and guide them through this. Even though I'm not too sure what this is, I know it's not a regular storm. I can feel that in the air. What I saw last night, I can't shake. Every time I try to close my eyes, I see those large, pale hands. Steve came to see me this morning to ask about it. I was honest with him. Never lied to him before. I wasn't about to start now. I told Steve about the hands that grabbed our ship, about the hundreds of hands I saw in the water. I told him about the face that was looking back at me. I spared no detail and looked him in the eye as every word left my lips. I've known that old bugger for a long time, but I've never seen his face change with emotion so quickly. They were... There was concern in his eyes, deep and burning. He asked me if I was all right, that my mind might be going, or perhaps I hit my head when I fell. I laughed it off. I told him he might be right. The concerned look never left his face, but I got him talking about something else. I didn't want to worry him anymore. I asked Steve how Andy and Michael were doing when I wasn't around. Surprisingly, he said they were in good spirits. The lads had a lot of faith in me. Steer us through the storm. I asked Steve to keep a close eye on them and let me know if their morale changes. I'll do everything in my power to get these boys home and safe. If what I saw last night was the unfathomable deep of legend, I can't let it take them. Not my crew. I'll do whatever is necessary. I'll protect them. It's my duty as their captain. This is Captain Reynolds signing off. The recording ends. Entry 7. The recording device turns on. Strong wind and sleet can be heard in the background. There was no other sound except for the raging storm for approximately three minutes. This is... doesn't matter. It's been a few days since my last entry. I wasn't entirely sure if I'd ever turn this thing on again, because there doesn't seem to be much point. I pride myself in being an optimistic, but a realistic man. The reality is this, my crew and I, trapped on this biblical storm with no way of escaping, we can't call for a rescue. Not that anyone would be able to reach us in the storm anyway. We only have enough food to last us a few more days. There's enough fuel for our emergency generator to last maybe an extra day or two afterwards. Once that runs out, we'll have no stove, refrigeration, lights. Nothing else to eat. This is our reality. This is what my crew understands. However, there is much more to it than that. Even if my crew does not want to listen to me, I've seen it again. A hand of the unfathomable deep. 
I woke up last night after falling asleep in my chair, trying to get a signal on our radio. As I made my way down to the bunks, I saw it. An ungodly large and waterlogged hand crept towards the door to the bunks. It moved slowly, almost as if it couldn't see what it was doing. The hand was attached to nothing. It was just suspended in the air, almost as if it was floating. It was dirt and grime under its black fingernails. It smelled of sweet rot and salt water. Time stood still as I watched. It was almost at the door when I realized what was happening. I quickly jumped into action, drawing my knife as I ran at whatever the hell that thing was. At least it would not take my crew without going through me first. Jamming the knife into the side of the hand, I heard a horrific cry come from the water. I quickly pulled it out and before jamming it in again. Dark blood oozed from the first puncture wound as I pulled my blade from the creature. It retreated into the water with more grotesque sounds emanating from the depths. I dare not approach the stern of my ship for fear of being dragged in. And instead, I stood guard at the entrance of the bunks until morning. Andy was the first of my crew to emerge from the bunks. He had a look of concern and confusion on his face when he saw me. I was soaked, dark bags under my eyes, and I still grasped my knife in my hand. I told him what had happened, and he, the concern on his face grew with each word I spoke. He helped me inside to warm up with the promise of keeping watch himself. He's a good lad. And I know he doesn't believe me. None of them do. Michael forced me to check temperature, thinking I might, might have come down with some kind of illness. I assured him I was in good health. But he wasn't so sure. Both Steve and Michael convinced me to stay in my bunk for the day to rest. Steve took charge of the radio for the day, but had no luck. The clock tells me it's 8.13. We have no real way of knowing if it's truly day or night. There's a darkness here that never lifts. A part of me had hoped that the storm might subside when I woke, or that Steve would have luck with the radio. I must remain realistic. Any other thoughts at this point are a farce. I'll keep watch over our ship tonight. My crew has asked me to join them below, but they did not see what I saw. They did not hear the cries coming from the depths or see the dark blood oozing from the creature I fought off that was looking to take them into the unfathomable deep. It will not take them. I won't allow it. I will keep them safe no matter the cost. A captain must do whatever he can to assure the safety of his crew. I sharpened my knife. I'm ready as I can be to fight this evil for the sake of my crew. They will not know the dark waters. I will not allow it to take them. This is Captain Reynolds signing off. The recording ends. Entry 8 The recording device turns on. As with previous entries, a severe storm can be heard raging in the background. The sounds of footsteps are heard along with Captain Reynolds talking incoherently under his breath for several minutes before he speaks clearly. I haven't rested in days. My watch has yet to end. The last few nights the hands have come for my crew. I am able to fight them off, but, but they are many. Last night I counted 42 in total, easily scared off with my knife, but I feel my body beginning to weaken. Surely they'll overwhelm me tonight. I locked my crew in the bunkhouse two days ago. They begged and pleaded with me to open the door for hours, but I will not. I must keep them safe. It's my duty as their captain. At night while they rest, I, I fight for their souls. They claim to not hear any of this fighting, but I, they claim that I've gone mad. How can they not see? How can they not understand? I had to lock them in for their protection. Although I must be realistic, tonight I fear it may be my final stand against the unfathomable deep. The clock tells me it's one. 
the hands will come soon. My body will fail me and the hands will drag my crew into the dark waters for all eternity. I will, I will fall tonight. I'm sure of that. What else could I do? I can't risk them helping me fight. One false move and, and they'll be taken. I can't allow their souls to be dragged into the dark waters. If only there was some way I could free them from the darkness we found ourselves in. Some way for me to assume their souls will be spared from the hell that awaits us in the unfathomable deep. Wait. Th that's it. Yes. That's it. It's the only way to save them. I, I know what needs to be done, but I must act quickly. Before the hands come, I must assure that my crew's souls are spared from the dark waters. This is the only way I'll save them. My duty as captain is to do so. I'll save my crew from the unfathomable deep. The recording ends. Entry 9. The recording device turns on. The sound of rain gently hitting a window and light winds blowing can be heard in the background throughout this recording. I did it. I was able to stop the hands from pulling my crew into the dark waters of the unfathomable deep. Their souls will rest in Fiddler's Green. It was at great cost, but they would understand had they been in my position. What happened was necessary to save their souls. I know, I know they would understand if they had laid their eyes upon the hands, if they saw the face I witnessed in the water that fateful night. My crew would not have called me crazy, and Steve wouldn't have tried to convince them to lock me in the bunkhouse before I could lock them in myself. Maybe things would have been different if they had just understood their danger. The look on that salty old bastard Steve's face when his eyes opened to see me standing over him wasn't a look of understanding or gratitude, it was of betrayal. I looked on as he tossed himself onto the floor and tried to crawl over to the other bunks as blood poured from the wound on his throat. Steve gripped his throat and was able to stop the bleeding just enough to find Andy and Michael in their bunks. Blood pooled on the floor beneath him. Neither of those boys even opened their eyes when I dragged my knife across their throats as they slept. In their final moments, they opened their eyes for a second, but there was no life behind them. Maybe, maybe they just accepted it. But perhaps they understood more than I thought. None of that mattered now. I, I had saved them from being dragged into the unfathomable deep. Steve let out a sound not unlike an injured whale when he turned to me. Falling on his back, I had known Steve for a long time. I considered him one of my closest friends, so I, I helped him outside and I sat with him while he took in his final breath. Steve never took his eyes off me the entire time. Tears rolled down his cheeks as he choked on his blood. It felt like it took hours for him to finally take his last breath. <laughs> he was always a tough son of a bitch. However, he looked away and he stared at the sea as his final breath was expelled from his lungs. I laid my friend back down in his bunk and I closed his eyes. They looked at peace with no fear of being dragged under. They now knew the peace and serenity of Fiddler's Green. As morning came, the storm lessened with severity. No doubt a reward for saving my crew from the dreaded evil below. Now I needed to rest. My work wasn't done, but I don't have the strength to do anything else today. The recording ends. It should be noted that there are several recordings of Captain Murray Reynolds talking to himself, repeating the phrase, I saved them, over and over again. This continued for approximately seven days, as seen on the recording device's files. With each new recording... The storm lessens until no audible storm is heard in the background of the logs. Entry 9. The recording device turns on. Gentle waves are heard in the background. After several minutes of a muffled voice speaking, Captain Murray Reynolds is heard screaming for approximately ten minutes. There are no discernible words aside from, I saved them, which he repeats. 
Entry 10. The recording device turns on. For several minutes, footsteps are heard, rapidly approaching and then moving away from the recording device. This continues until static is heard from an unknown source. Hello? Is anyone there? Captain Reynolds, do you copy? Attention, crew of the Ahab 2, do you copy? The above message repeats five times before Captain Reynolds can be heard in the distance. They've reached us. They're too late. I, I spared my crew from the dark waters. I must tell them. Others must be warned that the legends are true. Rapid footsteps are heard approaching the recording device. The click of a button is heard before Captain Reynolds speaks again. I copy this, Captain Reynolds of the Ahab 2. We were attacked, but my crew was saved. We don't require any assistance. Captain, do you mean you do not require assistance? Your ship was attacked? How has your crew been saved? Are, are there any injuries? We have a Coast Guard heading your way. There are a few hours, but don't worry. We'll help you and your crew. A loud thud is heard. Do you have cotton in your ears, boy? I told you, we do not need any assistance. My crew has been saved from what was attacking us. I do not need help. Do not send anyone into these waters. Something is out there. Something very evil. Captain, what are you talking about? What attacked you? Where is your crew? My crew has been saved. Their souls released so they wouldn't be dragged into the unfathomable deep. I saved them from the dark waters and granted them the paradise of Fiddler's Green. I saved them. This is the captain's job to protect his crew no matter the cost. There is silence for several seconds. Captain, is your crew... Are they alive? No. Their souls have been released so they wouldn't suffer the dark waters. I saved them. They would thank me if they could, had they seen what I saw. Captain Reynolds, are you confirming that you killed Steve Thomas, Andrew Rogers, and Michael Coppers? You killed them. No. No, boy, I freed them from an eternity of torment in the dark waters of the unfathomable deep. It had to be done by my hand. I was the only one who understood. I was the only one who saw the hands of the unfathomable deep. Of course, I, I wish it, it didn't have to come to that, but I saved them. They were free from an eternity of torment. Do not send anyone here. Spare them. The hands will take them and drag them into the unfathomable deep. There is no response on the radio. I freed them. They will thank me one day. I'll see them again and they'll thank me. They'll thank me. The recording ends. Entry 11. The recording device turns on. A gentle wind is blowing in the background as panicked breaths can be heard. I saw it again. The face of the unfathomable deep, it's returned. Why? I saved my crew. What else could it possibly want? There are several minutes of unintelligible speech, along with panic breathing. Unless, unless it wants me. And sparing my crew from the dark waters, I, if I doomed myself. It's looking at me. Its eyes are that of 10,000 tortured souls. I can see the, the suffering so many. So many has been taken. Can he, can he still take my crew? No. I can't let that happen. Not now. Not, not after what I... What I had to... It's fixated on me. It wants me. The sound of a chair scraping can be heard. To anyone who hears this, I plead to take my crew with you and leave these waters. Let my children know that their father died a hero, saving good men from an eternity of suffering. A human giving the ultimate sacrifice. Tell them, tell them that I love them and, the, and that I'm sorry for everything. Footsteps are heard moving away from the recording device before stopping. A good captain will always protect his men. No matter what the cost, I will save them. Save them one last time. Out of the hands of the unfathomable deep. Track me under. The footsteps are heard walking away from the recording device until they stop. 
A loud splash is heard, followed by a muffled yell and splashing in the water. A loud bellowing moan is heard. This sound source is unclear. There is no sound recorded for approximately three hours until the Coast Guard boats arrive. The recording ends. On July 13th, 2013, at approximately 9.21 a.m., the Coast Guard arrived at the location of the Ahab 2 to find the boat in a state of disarray. The main engine had been removed from the ship by unknown means, though it is theorized that it had been removed by another ship for scrap parts. There was a large amount of dead fish found on the live storage unit. Their cause of death is yet to be determined, but it can be assumed they died due to a lack of food. Several piles of fish bones were found scattered all over the ship's deck, along with human waste and dark blood of unknown origin. The captain's cabin was in a similar state, with discarded fish bones and food spread all around. The recording device used by Captain Murray Reynolds was found. Its battery was nearly depleted, but was still recording when the rescue crews arrived. The remnants of Steve Thomas, Andrew Rogers, and Michael Copper were found in the bunkhouse of the ship. All three bodies were carefully laid in their bunks, eyes closed, and hands folded on their chests. The cause of death of all three men was blood loss due to a laceration on their throats. A large amount of blood was found near the bunkhouse entrance and near the bed of Andrew Rogers and Michael Copper. Upon review of the audio journals, finding the knife belonging to Captain Murray Reynolds and DNA evidence, he was officially charged with the murder of all three men. It has been theorized that Murray Reynolds had a psychotic break due to the loss of his wife, and his children had contacted the police for a wellness check the day before he set off for his final fishing trip. They chose not to comment on a reason, but were concerned for their father's mental well-being. When the Coast Guard arrived, there was no sign of Murray Reynolds on board with no indication of where he might be. The only evidence of what had happened to him is the final recording, due to the splashing sound heard. It is assumed that he took his own life by drowning. The search for Captain Murray Reynolds was called off three days after the ship was found. The Ahab 2 was towed back to land and is currently being held as evidence with the intention of being given to the children of Murray Reynolds should they choose to keep it. Unofficially, there is no knowledge of the unfathomable deep or the creatures described by Murray Reynolds. It may never be known what happened during the horrific storm and what exactly drove Captain Murray Reynolds to take the life of his crew and his own whether it was indeed a force paranormal in origin that drove him to do so, or a psychotic break. The body of Captain Murray Reynolds has never been found, and the source of the loud bellow heard near the end of the final recording has yet to be identified. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or by listening to tonight's episode of the podcast, or by finding this in some other way that's not a podcast or a video, which I probably didn't upload, but hey, thank you for listening. And as always, I want to give a big thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. That includes everybody who's been waiting for me to update my Patreon, and I thank you all so, so much for being so patient with me. But especially, I want to give a thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Chance Burnett, Donna Krause, Tristan Pelton, Acid System, Adam Garrick, Aaron Stormcrow, Ika Limchok, Amber Clark, Angelus, Atomorous, Bastion Beefcake, Blue the Enigma, Braden Morris, Broken Beast 320, Captain Scurvy, Caspian, Shelly J, Cory Kenshin, Cronut 509, Crusader Chocobo, Cryptic Nightmares, Curse Pox Primark, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Daniel Paulson, Darth Miver, Deleted Account, Dirt Diver 030, M, Esteban, Fester's Lampshade, Freddy Krueger, Gorag Tri Magazine, Grand Moth the Milky, Hades Nephew, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Harley, Himbo Jerry, Horseman Sec Time, Insanity Gamer X, Jake Cairns, Jesus Cornell, Jordan Humble, Justin LaFontaine, Kaylee Ambrose, Kiri the Sloth, Crazy Kid, Cryolinian, Lambda M98, Lisa Cottrell, Little Crow, Lord Life's Best, Lupita Galvin, Love You Eminem, Matt Bach, Melted Lake, Michael Allen Jr. Bashirs, Mike, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Nate Cull, Nico Kayo, Psychomo, Red Shadow Cat, Rob Like Sharp Things, Sam Ahai, Sashi Sasaku, Seclude, Stricken, Tally Sue, Tater Chip, That Creepy Chick, The Ginger Bros, Turtle Man, Voice of Sand, William King, Xavier and Cheyenne, Yargul, and Zachary Graphius. If you would like to join this list of names that I horribly mispronounce, then please head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, or you can always check out the names in the description down below, or you can honestly support for even just $1, because it really helps me out when you guys do, and I appreciate it infinitely. 
So thank you all on Patreon. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you for watching on YouTube and subscribing and liking videos and leaving comments about videos that you like or leaving comments about why I haven't finished the fourth audiobook yet or leaving comments about <laughs> new stories that you've seen and you'd like to see on this channel. And to everyone, sweet dreams. <laughs>